This is a Sandy Boy Productions podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to All Have Another Podcast with Lindsay Hine. I'm your host, Lindsay. Thank you so much for being here today. Today, you're listening to episode 364, and my guest is Valerie Constein. Val is a steeplechaser. She ran in the 2020 Olympics in the steeplechase, which was very exciting. She is a three-time All-American. She ran for Colorado. And now competing as a professional athlete, she has a full-time job. And in this episode, we talk about what that was like making her first Olympic team, what it looks like to run at such a high level, unsponsored, how she feels about that, and what her day-to-day training and work life looks like. Val has a lot of big dreams and goals and has intentions to keep on making those teams. And I hope that you truly enjoy this conversation as much as I did. If you do enjoy this episode, leave us a quick rating and review so that potential new listeners can find the show. We are doing a monthly giveaway in 2022 for a pair of Gooder sunglasses. They are one of our sponsors on the show and I love their sunglasses so much. And so for every rating and review, you are entered to win a pair of their sunglasses. So we're picking a monthly winner. And I'm going to announce right now the January and February winners for the year so far. So if you hear your name here, send me an email, lindsay at sandyboyproductions.com, and we will get that pair of Gooder shades sent your way. So the first winner is Sarah Granata. And she left a review that everyone's best friend podcaster, an awesome podcast for runners and athletes alike. I find that I can relate to each conversation she has and the content is always inspiring. Sarah left a lot of other words here too, which I love so much. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it would take a long time. Uh, but Sarah, email me, Sarah Granada. Email me, Lindsay at sandyboyproductions.com to grab your pair of Gooder shades. And then our February winner, dun, dun, dun is Meredith Hensley. Love this podcast. I have learned so much and been super encouraged as a runner and a mom. Thank you, Lindsay. All right, Meredith, send me an email, lindsay at sandyboyproductions.com to claim your sunglasses from Gooder. Friends, if you want to be entered in the March giveaway, head over to iTunes and leave us a quick rating and review. All right, everybody. Well, enjoy my conversation with Val. Well, today on the podcast, we have Val Constein on the show. Welcome to the show, Val. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, so excited to have you. So you already got your run in today. You said it's snowing in Boulder. Yes, it is snowing pretty hard, but hopefully it stops soon. Do you ever hit the treadmill when it's like too much? Well, luckily, I'm a volunteer assistant coach for CU. So on days like this, I run in the indoor track. And it's 300 meters around, and in lane six, it's probably pretty close to 400. So, very lucky. Oh, that is nice. Do you hang in lane six? Is that what you do? Yeah, I hang in lane six, and I run clockwise, and then I switch, and I go counterclockwise. So, it's okay. pretty fun. Okay, how in the world do you have time to do that when you're working full-time and training so intensely? <laughs> <laughs> well, this morning, I got up at 6 a.m., and <laughs> we were running by 7, so... We got done at around 8.30 and then because my roommate works a full-time job too. And so her and I do a lot of training together. And so we go in and we run together for an hour and a half and then we come home and we get on to our full-time jobs at nine. That's so Crazy. helpful to have like a roommate that's on the same schedule as you though, because I could see if you had a roommate that just trained full-time getting like maybe a little resentful, like must be nice. I have to get this done now. Yeah. And I, I couldn't imagine also, you know, potentially being in a group of full-time professionals too, because then coach would say, okay, workout starts at 10. And I'm like, well, I'm already two meetings deep and like yeah. into a project by then. So yeah. that wouldn't work. So who is your roommate? My roommate is a girl named Kaylee Bogina. She went to Adams State University in Alamosa 
And then her boyfriend actually is on the team at CU. So he's like my, you know, athlete. Oh, yeah, yeah. How did you guys connect? So her boyfriend and my boyfriend both went to school at Western State in Gunnison. Okay. And they were really close on the team together. And then when Charlie, that's Kaylee's boyfriend, decided to move to Boulder um, to, to transfer to CU, Kyle and I were like, oh, well, why don't you move in with us? We have an empty room. And so then it, it just worked out really well. And she's incredible. She's an amazing training partner. And those Alamosa kids are tough. So it is amazing to have someone like that to train with. Oh, that's so cool. It's cool because you have trained with like veterans like Jenny Simpson. And now you're training with someone that's like a couple, maybe a couple steps behind you graduated after you. That's really cool. Yeah, it's really fun. And, you know, she's a pretty high mileage girl. And so anytime I want to double, she's always game. And so I pretty much never have to run alone. And it is amazing. Okay, so Val is became an Olympian this year. You've probably heard that in the intro, everybody, but very exciting things to talk about um, from this year alone, but your career in general. But what are you doing right now, mileage lies? Like what is happening in your life right now? So in September, I actually, well, I guess in like uh, at the beginning of September, I kind of had a little like flare up of my Achilles. And so I took a week off and then I was really careful getting back into training. But then in November, it completely healed and I was ready to like get into some high quality training. And so from December until now, at the end of January, I've been running quite a lot, I would say between 70 and 80 miles a week, um, pretty consistently. And this is the best I've ever felt in January in my entire life. So that's I'm amazing. very excited. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. What are you what are you gonna run like an indoor season as a steeplechaser? What do you do? That's a great question. Um, I mean the most logical thing is the flat 3K because it's the same distance but considerably faster. But I actually so it's January twenty seventh and on Saturday of this week I will be racing the mile at the CU invite. Oh cool. And that'll be fun. And then I on February 10th or 11th, I can't remember the date exactly, I plan to race the flat 3K at Husky in Seattle. Okay. And that'll be my indoor season. I'll just run two races. Two races. Hopefully they go well and then focus on outdoor. Um, what is your mile PR? So my mile PR is actually from 2015. Wow. Yeah, and I think... I mean, I guess I would have to check my T first, but <laughs> I think it's like 450 or 447, something in there. Okay. And so we're hoping to run about that fast at altitude this weekend. Okay. Yeah, that's so crazy. It's it's always fun to like get after it at a distance that you haven't raced in a really long time, especially, you know, after the year that you just had. Like, it's safe to say your career is at a totally different level than it was in 2015. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And I'm <laughs> in a totally different spot too. So I think that it should be a lot better and I'll feel good about myself. I'm oh, sure. that's good. Um, okay. So third place at the Olympic trials became an Olympian this year. Very excited in the steeplechase. Talk to us a little bit about your steeplechase journey. I know that you were recruited to run at Colorado by um, Mark Wetmore and Heather Burroughs to steeple before you'd even ever steepled. That is true. Yeah, it was really funny. Um, I remember my uh, senior year of high school, I was actually cross country skiing and my cross country ski coach was like in the office and he was watching some video and I was like, what are you watching? And he was like, Val, do you know who this is? And it was some person running the steeplechase at like Worlds or something. And I was like, nope, no clue. He was like, that's Emma Coburn, the best steeplechaser in America. And he was like, you're going to see you. You're going to get to be, be coached by her coaches. And that's when it kind of all sunk in. I was like, oh my gosh, like this is crazy. I would love to be where she is at some point. And so just at C, but it's funny because my first steeplechase I ever did at CU, I ran like 11 minutes and 20 seconds in the steeplechase. And then um, just, I kept at it, kept being consistent. And then by the time I graduated, I had run, I think, like 945, 946 
in a steeplechase. Um, and then obviously last year I, I PR'd quite a bit, but Crazy. it's kind of, it's amazing how, how much you can change in a steeplechase since it's a technical event. Um, working on your form can shave seconds off your time. Yeah. I mean, the amount of seconds you shaved off your time last year is intense. Yeah. Cause the, my first race at the POTS invite, I ran like 10 Oh six. And then I went to the Oregon relays and raced against three other people in this steeple chase. And I ran nine forty two. And then when I went to, uh, Mount Sac at the golden games, I ran nine thirty six. And then when I raced at Portland Track Fest, I ran 9.25. And then at the trials, I ran 9.18. So that was kind of crazy to see that happen. But I think a huge part of that growth was uh, confidence in my ability to race. Um, let's talk about mindset going into the trials. I mean, I think everybody knows Emma Coburn and Courtney Frey Ricks are the two names everybody kind of expected to make the team. Colin Quigley withdraws from the trials. At what point are you like, I can make this Olympic team? I Everything I have done, like I am worthy to be here and I can make this team. I knew that I had a chance after I ran the A standard at Portland Track Fest because, I mean, Colleen was definitely the person – to beat for that third place spot. Cause you know, she's a very dominant steeplechaser and she hadn't raced all season. And because of her history of injury, I was just like, okay, well, I mean, she hasn't raced yet. Is she going to open up with, you know, a nine twelve? Right. I don't know. And so when I ran nine twenty five, that was at the time, the third best time in the U S that year. And so I knew that if I had a good day, it would happen because I knew that Leah had the potential to run, you know, close to 915 because she had done it in the past. And I knew that Marissa Howard was capable of running sub 920 and Courtney Wayman was also capable of a sub 920, but I thought I was too. And I knew it would be a hard race, but I like to think I have a pretty good uh, racing tactic and racing strategy and I'm able to stay calm and put myself in a good position and avoid drama in the race. And so I knew it was always a possibility, but I didn't want to make any bold statements or anything. Just put my head down and work towards that goal. How do you stay calm? Because, I mean, it's arguably you are in a very stressful situation. I mean, vying for that third spot, like like you said, you, all those people you just mentioned, like you all had a good shot, but it was all pretty close to the same good shot. Yeah, it was. it was a very tight race when you think about it. But before the race, my coaches, all of them were just telling me, run your own race, like keep track of the clock, make sure your splits are honest. Don't go out too hard, but don't go out too slow. And so I knew if I put myself from the beginning in like position five or position four, that that would be good. And so that's just what I tried to do. And I tried to just run on the rail pretty much the whole time. And I got jostled a little bit. I actually took a step off the track at one point because someone bumped into me. But, you know, you just take a deep breath, shake out your arms and keep your eyes on the barrier ahead of you. And then when the race finally picked up, um, I was basically in position four and I was able to just in the last two laps really drop the hammer and put some space in between me and the fourth position person. And so it ended up being a good race, but it took a lot of mental fortitude to like shut things off and focus. So hard. Did you see Leah fall? I did because I saw her make the move. So it was like with four laps to go or something in the race. Uh, Courtney or Emma had sprinted to the front at that point because Courtney was already in the front. And then Emma and Courtney were kind of going for it with four laps to go. And Leah decided to go with them. And Emma, Courtney, and Leah were all running about 9, 10 pace at that point. And I knew that I couldn't run 9, 10. I knew it. I was like, 9, sub 9, 20 would be amazing. Like, that would be huge, and that's what I'm capable of. And so when they took off, I was thinking, like, okay, whatever. Like, if Leah, if Leah makes this team and runs a 9, 10, that's amazing. She deserves it. And I was like, but she would have 
like that would have been totally amazing. But I knew that I had to just follow my race plan. Cause even if I did run sub nine twenty, that would be huge for me. Fourth place at the trials would have been amazing. And so I just stuck to my race plan. But then when I did see her fall with what three, two or three laps to go, I, I kind of knew that at that point that nine ten probably was a little too fast for her and that she was getting really tired. Mm -hmm. And then I knew that my biggest competitions were Marissa Howard and Courtney Wayman and Grayson Murphy. I Grayson, almost forgot yeah, about she had Grayson. a great race. <laughs> she did. And so I knew that those three women were literally right behind me. And at the time, Marissa was actually in front of me. And so I just knew that I had to like give it 110% for those last two laps if I wanted to make that team. And I'm glad that I did because I had no idea where Courtney Wayman was. And it turns out she was only a couple seconds behind me. So it ended up turning out uh, like a dream. So I'm really happy that I followed my race plan. Did it feel real? Like you're like, did this just happen? I was a little bit in shock and I crossed the finish line and I was completely exhausted. Mm. And then Courtney Frericks comes up to me and she she grabs me by the shoulders and she says, you made the team. Oh. And, and I was just so happy. And, but I, I, I was like so dizzy and freaked out because I had never like really ran that hard in my life. And um, <laughs> so we stand on the podium and I'm kind of like dizzy and nauseous. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, am I really standing on the podium? And then it was actually really funny. Um, we get off the podium and I'm like, Oh, I don't feel so good. And so I like walk off to the edge of the track and I like puke for like three minutes, just <laughs> so sick. And then I like finally start to feel a little better. And I look up and like all of the Bowerman track club people are like standing there and they're like, yay, go around. It was kind of embarrassing, but it was awesome. And then we did our victory lap and it was kind of like, oh my gosh, this is so surreal. I can't believe this happened. And then and we finished the victory lap. And when I see my family and my boyfriend and my sister, I just... I'm so emotional at that point because I realized that I made that team the hardest way possible with zero help, no support, all out of my own pocket. And it really just sunk in that like I had done it and I had been working so hard and it all paid off. So I was very emotional in that moment. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine how your family felt too, like seeing you accomplish that. I cannot imagine being in those stands, like watching that last lap go down. Um, yeah. So you're, you run in rabbit gear. What shoes do you wear? I was wearing the dragonflies okay. the whole year. Okay. Um, cause they're, they were awesome. And my coaches at CU, Mark and Heather, they believe that the Nike dragonflies are the best track shoe. Mm -hmm. And so I trust them. So that's what I was wearing. So, okay, what is that like then? Because you love working full time. I know that you really thrive off of this like busier schedule where you have to go to work and do your things. But do you want to seek sponsorship? Yeah, we I am working with an agent. Okay. I am working with Josh Cox and we are actively trying to okay. find a sponsor because I mean, I don't really make that much money with my nine to five job. And um, Boulder is not cheap. Let's just say that. <laughs> that's true. Boulder is not cheap. And so it's, I'm not like making the savings that I would like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm an Olympian. I'd love to be compensated for all my hard work. And, you know, I'm kind of sick of going into, you know, Roadrunner Sports and Boulder Running Company to buy pairs of shoes every couple months. And, you know, spikes are impossible to find because, they're so coveted and everyone's buying them. And so it's really hard um, to kind of deal with that. But unfortunately, like it's been really hard to find a sponsor. A lot of sponsors really want me to join mm -hmm. the groups that are not in Boulder. Yeah. And I don't want to do that. I've had a lot of success with Mark and Heather and with CU. And I don't want to leave. Like my boyfriend lives here. My friends live here. And my full-time job is here. And so it's been hard. And I'm hoping that once these shoe companies kind of finalize their budgets for the year, that they'll be able to find something for me. Um, but I think that there is a lot of apprehension about signing me because I kind of came out of nowhere in college. Yeah, I was decent, but I never cracked into that top three. I was 
only a three-time All-American where most of my Olympic competitors were national champions at one point or have already made world teams or were, you know, 10-time All-Americans. And so I think there is a lot of apprehension about me, but I mean, I'm only 25 yeah. and I've got a lot of great years of running left in me. And I think if shoe companies could only see that, the value in me, I think things would be different, but we just have to be patient. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was going to say, what's your pitch to the shoe company? But I'm thinking like, I think, and this is what I said about um, athletes like Kira D'Amato before she was sponsored or like a Sarah Vaughn, anybody it's like, like that wasn't sponsored, right? It's like you have a story and if you're willing to share your story with the world on social media or whatever that looks like on podcasts, like that is so valuable to the brand and the fact that you do work full time and you do love that and you have your own way of doing things. Like, I think that that should be very valuable for the company. And I think that my story is a lot more relatable. Yeah. Nobody gets giant contracts out of college to just be a full-time runner. That doesn't happen. Most people, their professional running dreams are dependent on getting a full-time job and making training work around your real life. And so, I mean, I don't know. I think that there's a lot of value in that because not only am I one of the best runners in the world, but I also am super relatable to the customer, this person who's going to be buying the shoes. So hopefully companies can see the value in that. But um, yeah, we just have to wait for the right one. It's just crazy for me to think that there's that an Olympian is going into a shoe, like a specialty run store to buy their own shoes. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird. It's super weird because like the people that work at the stores (laughs) like know who I am. And they're just like, what are you doing? Like, what's what's happening? And I'm like, oh, I don't have a contract. Yeah. And they're just like, I don't understand that. Yeah. I don't understand it either, but it is what it is. Well, I think working with Josh, Josh Cox is a really smart move because he clearly has proven that he knows what he's doing in the industry. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it is odd because this is probably the longest time Josh has had an athlete as good as me that he hasn't been able to sign. Mm. And so I know it's frustrating for him. I know that he's just like kicking himself and <laughs> I'm sure he's working very hard at it. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure he is. Yeah. Um, tell us about the rabbit partnership. I know they like, they had a big showing of athletes at the marathon trials and even at the track trials wearing their gear. So what does that partnership look like? Yeah. So it's actually called Tracksmith. Oh, um, Tracksmith. I'm sorry. Yeah, there there is one called Rabbit, but no, I know. I got. I always get those two confused for some reason. They kind of look. They kind of have similar rabbits. styles. Yeah, and oh. both of the logos are rabbit. You're right. So the, you're right. I think the Tracksmith is a is a hare technically, mm-hmm. and then the Rabbit one is a, a rabbit. But um, Tracksmith has been. It, it was great, and I think that for me at the time, it made a lot of sense because I wasn't good enough to get like a legitimate contract, but having some type of, you know, soft representation was really nice because it is kind of strange when you graduate from college and you enter in a race and you think, what, what do I wear? Who am I associated with? Yeah. What am I? Who am I? And so just having a kit was nice, just something to wear for the races. And then at the trials, actually, they had kind of some more support where they had like a massage therapist Mm -hmm. and they had Norma tech boots and they had stuff for their athletes. And so that was really nice. Um, because that's a very common thing with other brands to have like the brand house that you can get stuff from. Mm -hmm. So that was really great. Um, but they, I think that Tracksmith is definitely on the They're headed in a good direction, and I think that with Nick Willis kind of leading that amateur support program, he has a really good idea of, like, what Tracksmith needs to do to kind of get to that next level. Because Tracksmith didn't have enough money to actually pay any of their athletes. Mm -hmm. So Tracksmith, they didn't pay me anything. And that's something that people don't realize. They think, oh, Val's so good, Tracksmith must be paying her. But I didn't receive, like, anything from them, just clothing. And then when I made the team they gave me a bonus but like until then (laughs) 
there, there was no money from Tracksmith. And so I think that, uh, they're definitely working on trying to provide more support for their athletes. And I could see them in the future doing like some kind of tier program where if you're like a top tier athlete, maybe they can help out Mm. with, uh, stipends or they could pay for travel. But, um, last year, yeah, it was just clothing, which was still very nice. Hey everybody, a quick break to thank ZocDoc for supporting this episode of the podcast. No one knows what you're looking for in a doctor better than you. And no one's better at giving you the tools to find the perfect doctor than ZocDoc. The people who created ZocDoc found the major pain points in healthcare, all the things that weren't working, and said enough. Then they made booking a great doctor surprisingly pain-free. With ZocDoc, you can find doctors that are in your insurance network, putting you on the path to see the doctors who are right for you and not wasting any time figuring out who's in network and who's not. ZocDoc is a free app that shows you doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, and are available when you need them. Go to ZocDoc.com slash another and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then start your search for a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash another, ZocDoc dot com slash another. Um, talk to us about your first Olympics and um, you being Team USA teammates with Courtney Freyricks and Emma Coburn. <laughs> It was amazing. So it was a little overwhelming because of all of the super strict um, COVID regulations because the Japanese almost canceled it because they were so concerned that we would get their population sick. And Team USA actually did have a positive test while we were there, but only one athlete uh, couldn't compete because of COVID. What a bummer. I know. Imagine. And I forget. Oh, geez. What was his name? He was a pole vaulter. Ooh, I should know this. But I do think I remember that. Yeah, it was very sad. Bummer. And so I felt very bad for him. But it was amazing. I mean, Tokyo is like the cleanest city I've ever seen in my entire life. And we had this amazing USA training facility that we went to every day where they had this beautiful track and this amazing weight room and swimming pools, soccer fields, everything for all the athletes that were there. And it was awesome. It was so fun. And then obviously the gear is, was amazing. Like I, I went to Tokyo with one suitcase and I came home with four suitcases. <laughs> this gave us so much stuff. Um, I'd love to go back to Tokyo just for a vacation mm. to kind of explore the city and kind of immerse more in the culture because we did not have a lot of uh, interactions with the Japanese people. Uh, just because we were really confined to the village and our training facility. So it would be great to go back. Um, It was really cool to see our athletes from all over the world there. That was amazing. You'd just be going for an easy day around the village and you'd see people from Nigeria. You'd see people from Ireland, from Poland, all over the world. Um, And it was also funny to see athletes that train in Boulder Uh training, going like there in Tokyo because it was like I ran into Aisha I ran into Dom Scott I ran into Ollie I ran into all these people that are it's so funny how many Olympians per capita there are in Boulder oh yeah crazy but being with Emma and Courtney in Tokyo was absolutely amazing Courtney is so calm so level-headed it's it's amazing she's really soft-spoken and sweet And Emma is just like a big sister. I swear. It's so nice. Like I have some anxieties with like dining halls. And I was also super nervous because of how many people there were. I felt nervous about taking off my mask Mm -hmm. because I didn't want to get sick. And Emma like helped me in the dining hall (laughs) so that I wouldn't feel so anxious. And so there, it was a very high quality group of women. And then I spent a lot, a lot of time with Heather McLean and Eleanor Purrier because Heather was my roommate. Oh, okay. So those women are amazing. And it was, it was so fun to just like get to know them and 
get to know Courtney and Emma better. And so it was, it was just like an A plus experience. That's so cool. Yeah. What is it like, like when you went to college and your coach was like, see that that's the best steeplechaser in America. And then to be teammates with her, I mean, kind of a few short years later. Yeah. I I never thought I'd be on a team with her. And so then making that team, it was just incredible because it felt like everything that I had been, you know, working towards my whole life and, and the person that I had idolized since I was like 16 years old was now someone that I was like going to practice with and lifting weights with and, you know, towing the line with. And so it was, it was amazing. So you mentioned like you were a three-time All-American. You weren't someone that in college people would expect or you might expect who would become an Olympian. So after college, once you start training and getting to, into a rhythm with work and everything, when do you realize, oh, I do want to train really hard and I actually do think that I can do this? I, I really wanted to keep training after college. That was always something that I was interested in because – in college, I, especially my last year of college, I had kind of a string of like unlucky things happen to me right after my super amazing cross country season where I finished 30th and I was so happy. I got mono. And mm-hmm. so I was sick for like, I couldn't run for like a month Ugh. because I had mono. And then in March, like right when the outdoor season was going to start, I actually was going to class, riding my bike to class, and I got hit by a car. Oh. And I like woke up in the ambulance and was like, oh my God, what happened? That's and terrifying. It was, it was awful. And I had a concussion and I like couldn't really train for like three weeks. And so between getting like mono and having to take basically the whole month of December off and then getting hit by a car in March... I didn't really have that much time to train for when outdoor was starting. Cause I mean, my goal was to make it to NCAAs, which is in like the first week of June or the end of May. And at that point I was like, Oh my gosh, this, this is going to keep me from reaching what my potential was. And so because of that, I always knew that I at least wanted to train through to the trials because I was like, I think I could run faster than what I did. Um, cause I ran nine 45 or whatever, which is, which is good. But I, I really thought that I could run sub nine forty. I really did. And that was my goal. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I just want to train through the trials and do it. And then the pandemic happened and it was kind of like, well, now what, like, what am I training for? What, what's going on? And I had these part-time jobs that really weren't paying the bills and, I like didn't really know what I was doing, but I knew that training was something that brought me a lot of happiness and joy. And so I was like, okay, even if these jobs suck, even if like, I'm not super crazy about my like working professional life, every time I run, I feel so much better. And so that's when I kind of knew that like, I wanted to keep running at any capacity that I could. And then when I got my job at stride, the full-time job, training became a lot harder, but then it became even more special. Mm. Like when I had that hour, two hours a day where I was just like training, it just made everything else seem so much better. And I just really leaned into that. um, How, how running fast and how feeling good after a run just boosted my whole personality and made me feel so much better. And so it was just a happiness thing for the longest time. And then when I, ran 936 at the Golden Games, I was like, oh my gosh, like I beat some actual professionals and I was only a couple seconds behind like some really amazing runners. And then I was like, okay, well, maybe I should try to, you know, have some, you know, p- professional running goals at this point. And um, that's kind of when I decided that I really wanted to like give it my all and be like more invested in training and everything. Were you working, like when you graduated college, did you continue on working with Mark and Heather? I know you work with them now, but like, did you take a break at all? No, I continued working with them. But after 
So I actually broke my calcaneus and tore my planter like in the fall of 2019. <laughs> Jeez. So it was like my first couple months out of college and my first couple months working this like terrible part-time job. And I sustained this major injury and I was out from running for like four months to heal from the calcaneus and the planter. And so then I started training again in like December and then 2020 came around and I really wasn't super fit, but I was like, Oh, I'll try to make it work. I can, I still have a time that can make it to the trials. And then the pandemic hit and uh, everything got shut down. But I, I was working with Mark and Heather, but because of that calcaneus and plantar injury, it was kind of at a limited capacity. I mean, it's really cool to hear of stories that had like redemption stories. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but like that happened throughout the pandemic, right? Because right before the pandemic, you had all these hard, physical, emotional obstacles that you had to overcome and had the trials been it's summer 2020, like, would you have been ready? Like, it's really cool to hear these stories where, like, athletes have developed so much during these, like, crazy two years. Yep. I definitely developed a lot during that time. I, I mean, the athlete that I was in 2019, she is miles behind the athlete that I am now in 2022. I've heard you say that um, happiness is such an important part of athletic success. How do you find your happiness? I find my happiness. I I bought these two cats. Oh, I love it. (laughs) In the pandemic, I bought them like, well, adopted them, I guess, from the Humane Society in September of... 2020 I think and um they have brought me so much happiness oh. where like I come home and they're just happy to see me and like when I'm working from home they just like lay on top of me they love it and another thing is I have a really great relationship with my boyfriend we're we're in a really great spot we are we don't fight we don't argue we're just like happy to be with each other and my roommate too Kaylee she brings me a lot of happiness too and and I think that um And Boulder brings me a lot of happiness just being here in this city. And so it's just, it's it's made a huge difference. Um, How do you guys handle living with boyfriend and roommate who's a friend? How do we handle like dishes and things like that? Kaylee is a queen. She just cleans up her stuff immediately, never have to ask. And I don't know, we're just really self-sufficient. Like we're all adults here. We're not you know, college kids yeah, or anything. And we just, we just do our thing. Yeah. That's really cool. When, how did you and your boyfriend meet? We met actually, it was in like the fall of 2018 and we met through a mutual friend. One of my friends was like, Hey, one of my friends from work is like at this sushi restaurant. Do you want to like go? And I was like, yeah, sure. Whatever. That sounds fun. And then we go and when I like see him, I'm like, oh my gosh, wow. (laughs) And then we just like started talking. And then after talking for like a couple weeks, we were like, uh, we should date. And then we just started dating. What does he do? So he works for Wheels Up. It's a private jet charter company. Um, And he's working on a like communications project because wheels up just acquired like a whole bunch of other smaller aviation uh companies and so he's working on this project to like make sure everyone talks to each other in like the same way so that there's just more cohesion hey friends a quick break here do you have a koala clip yet do you know what they are this is the best way to carry your phone on the run on the bike running errands, wherever you're going. It just clips right into the back of your sports bra, zips up, stays totally dry. Your phone doesn't bounce around. It's so convenient. I've been using my Koala Clip for probably three years now. And Christina, the founder of this company, had a vision and she went all in. I'm so proud of her and love her products. They also have a really cute apparel line now. I actually got my sister 
Um, I got her a koala clip and then I got one of the sweatshirts, the grit and grace sweatshirt from koala clip for Christmas. Um, and their new sports bras. I'm telling you what, every time that sucker is clean, I have it back on because I love it so much. It is super comfortable, supportive. And of course your koala clip fits right in. I love the material as well. Um, they also have really cute tights that are brand new to their line. Definitely check out Koala Clip. Go support Christina, the founder, and get yourself some awesome products. Go to koalaclip.com and use the code ANOTHER. That will get you 15% off your order. That's koalaclip.com. Use the code ANOTHER for 15% off. All right, friends, back to my conversation with Val. So you became an Olympian last year. What are the next big goals? I just want to run fast. Mm. I think that that's like my only goal is I just, I just want to run fast. And I, I would love to have the opportunity to race at USA's again this year. Um, and then I also would love to race some diamond league races as well. Um, I have this idea of racing Monaco, <laughs> the diamond league in Monaco. And then I'm also a huge Formula One fan. And if I race that race in Monaco and I take two weeks off from running, then I can hop over to Belgium and watch the Belgian Grand Prix. And so that's kind of like what I'm looking forward to in the future. Okay. I love that you're like not making it all running and you're like, I want to do that too. And if I can like we squeeze this in this way, where are you from that you're a big Formula One fan? <laughs> I am I'm from Vail and it's, it wasn't like oh, a right. thing <laughs> it wasn't like a thing there but during the pandemic um my boyfriend and I started watching that Netflix series Drive to Survive okay and then we started we watched it and we were like oh my gosh that's so cool and we watched it in um like f March I guess because that's when the pandemic first hit and we were all like shut down so we watched the whole two seasons of Drive to Survive that were on Netflix. And we were like, oh my gosh, Formula One is so sick. And so then we were actually able to start watching the races at the end of March. And so then that was the first season that we watched was the 2020 Formula One. And then we watched the 2021 and now we're really excited to watch the 2022 season. Oh, that's so cool. Okay. I get so confused with, with the drive, like car stuff. Like there's NASCAR and there's Formula One and then there's Indy cars, right? Yeah. Is that the and three? And there's lots. There's there's a lot. Because okay. now they have electric cars and they have the women's series and they have rally cars. But I think the biggest ones are probably Formula One, NASCAR, and IndyCar. Okay. Because I'm from Indianapolis. So we go to the Indy 500 every year and... I'm not like a huge race car fan, but like we lived just like five miles from the track. So we would ride our bikes down and go to the race with our friends and stuff. And it was always really fun. We, we recently moved, but I'm like, I feel like we need to go back for the race. That's really cool. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. You just like bike down and you bring, you know, your cooler or whatever and you just hang out all day. And yeah, I mean, I don't think I realized until I was a little bit older into adulthood how cool it was that we lived like right by the Indy 500 track. That's super cool because a lot of those races are really hard to get to. Yeah. Like the parking's crazy. And then like my boyfriend and I went to the Formula One race in Austin, Texas, this the past one in 2021 and it was really hard to actually get to the race yeah. so you were very lucky that you live <laughs> five miles away and could ride your bike and it's more fun to ride your bike it's kind of a cool experience because a lot of people in the city do it and you put like your your you know bluetooth speaker on your bike and everybody's kind of like tailgating will stop halfway there and like talk to each other and stuff. It's like a big community event. And obviously people travel from all over the world to also come. Yeah. It's crazy. The world interest in race cars. I love it. That's crazy though, that you guys became so hardcore from watching that Netflix show. And then you literally went to Austin just for that race. Yeah, we did. We went to Austin for the race and, but now we're planning an international trip. We want to go to the Belgian Grand That's Prix. That's so, so cool. We're pretty diehard fans now. <laughs> okay, what's the most recent Netflix uh, show that you've binged then? Not that you have tons of time for that, but... 
yeah, I I really liked the show Emily in Paris. I thought oh, okay. it was cute. Yeah. And then now I'm watching Peaky Blinders. Okay. And I like that too. So. So day in the life, you get up. I know you go do your morning workout. You said at seven. You work during the day. When do you double? Do you do lunchtime or after work? So a lot of, well, for big days, I only do a half day of work and then I work on the weekends. Okay. So I usually my big days are usually Wednesday and Friday are big days because Tuesday is a big day too, but I don't actually go into practice. I just try to get my run in before 9am and then I will take like a break from work at like four, go for a double and then come back and work until 530 or six. Um, but for those big days, like that video that I made was a Friday. Mm -hmm. And so on Fridays, I will get up pretty early, go for a double, usually like three to five miles in the morning. And then I come home and a lot of times I work from home. But recently I've been doing some metabolic data tests at work. And so then I would drive to work do those tests for a couple hours and then come home. And a lot of times I'll work from home for a little bit. And then um, usually the CU team practices at two. So then I show up to practice at two to be able to do the workout with them. And after the workout on Friday, I usually go lift weights for an hour too. And so I'm, sometimes I'm not home until like 5 p.m. on Fridays. And <laughs> then I just like try to get as much sleep as possible so that I can get up early and work a little bit on Saturday. So it sounds like is work more so like get what you need to get done or are you like obligated to 40 hours or is it just like sometimes it's a little more, sometimes it's a little less as long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to do? I, there is a lot of flexibility. In my contract, it does say 40 hours a week. Yeah. And so I really try to make that happen. But, you know, sometimes it's 38 hours, sometimes yeah. it's 45 hours. It just kind of depends. And because I work for a tech company, like if there's certain releases that we have or if there's a software bug, sometimes we'll have a ton of emails. And so then it's, you know, I'll be working, you know, if there was overtime, I would be working overtime to fill that need. Yeah. I mean, I just think that in the past couple years, it we have gotten – so fortunate that a lot of companies have realized like it doesn't have to be nine to five like you know and I mean I'm thank God my husband you know he used to go into the office pretty much like I don't know eight to five seven to six sometimes whatever he you know needed to do to get everything done sometimes he'd get home at like 9 p.m though but um now it's just like he works from home same company and like if there's like stuff in the middle of the day or whatever, like take care of it and just, you know, I just feel like there's so much more flexibility and understanding now. There's one blessing that has come out of this pandemic. And I think that that is a big one. I agree 100 percent because, I mean, I, I save at least an hour every day by not having to go into the office, by not having to like get ready. I mean, a lot of times I will like roll out of bed open my computer, work for a couple minutes, and then go for my run, come back from the run, work for a little bit, and then take a shower and then keep working. And that's not really possible. Like if you have to go into work, you got to figure out like, okay, I got to do my hair. I got to pick out an outfit. And, and then the driving drive. part. Yeah. yeah, I know. And I, I honestly feel like if I can work for like 20, 30 minutes right after I wake up, that's like two hours. That's like it. You know what I mean? You're so much more yeah. efficient. Nobody's bugging you. You just like in the zone. Yeah. And the house is quiet. No yeah. one else is up yet because it's five in the morning. Oh, it's, yeah. It's great. I it's love that. It's the way to do it. Um, okay. So world championships are this summer. What are, Do you have your sights set on that? I would love to, to have the opportunity to race at USA's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, I mean, it's going to be a tough field to beat because like you, you've got everybody's returning. Marissa Howard's having a baby, so that might be kind of tough to turn around from. But pretty much everyone else that was at the trials is going to be there. And there's always collegiates that come out of the woodwork. Maybe there's another freak like me who's been training super hard by themselves. And so I think it's not going to be an easy team to make. And that's why I'm just training as well as I can to kind of increase my odds. What does it feel like now, though? Because before it was like you said, you're like, 
freak like you like you came out like oh where did she come from you know maybe people didn't realize how hard you were training or what you were what you were doing behind the scenes but now we know you made an Olympic team so how does it feel going in not being the underdog I think a lot of people still are going to underestimate me so I think in some regards I still am kind of an underdog um because I'm sure there's still people who are like oh she like wasn't the best one or whatever and and I still kind of think of myself as an underdog, even though I did make the Olympic team. And so I don't feel much different about it. Is that hard to hear? Like when you refer to that, are you referring because Leah fell? And I think that there's other people that like didn't start. Oh, that, co- uh, Colleen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so there's people who think that like if Leah hadn't fallen, she yeah. would have made the team. There's people who think that if Colleen had chosen to race, I wouldn't have made the team. And there's people who think that Courtney Wayman one more year is going to be better than me too. And so I think that, yeah, there's still a lot to prove and I'm totally ready. How do you reconcile those feelings? Like, you know, like I think everybody in their career in some way, shape or form has like this imposter syndrome that kind of creeps in their head. Even the most confident, cocky people, I bet have a little bit of that creep in. So how do you like reconcile that and speak the truth that you are good enough to be there and that like you were the one to make the team? All those things might have happened, but you made the freaking team. Yeah, I think that, um, well, one of the things that I have in my bedroom, I have my third place medal from the trials just like sitting on top of my dresser. So every day when I'm getting dressed or brushing my hair or whatever, I, I just look at it to kind of show myself like, yeah, this is mine. I earned it and I earned it the hard way. And there's people who don't think I deserve it, but I got it. Mm. And also anytime I do a killer workout, anytime I have a super fast workout that I feel good about, I can tell my boyfriend about it and he's like, oh my gosh, that's so crazy fast. And, And it is. I think about workouts that I was doing in 2017 and they were nothing compared to what I'm doing now. And then um, I know you had like some mental health struggles like over the past few years. Like how have you come to a place now where you're feeling good and healthy? Yeah, um, that that took a long time to deal with because some of like the eating disorder stuff came around in high school. And so I was dealing with it, you know, pretty much throughout high school and then into college, most of college. I mean, that was like, probably seven years of really bad habits and really unfortunate mental health. And so it, it definitely took a long time to kind of work through And you know, I I'm still working through it every day. There's still certain things that might trigger me or might make me feel like I need to go back to what I was doing. But luckily my boyfriend is super supportive. Like anytime I'm having bad thoughts, I just, I tell him that I'm having bad thoughts and then we talk about it and we work through it. And it's amazing to have someone so supportive in my life. What did that look like in college and now working with Mark and Heather? Like, did you ever talk to them about that? Yeah, Heather, I I talk to Heather about it usually in college, but Heather wasn't really sure like what to do exactly. So she would always say, you know, maybe you should talk to the nutritionist or Mm -hmm. Maybe you should talk to like the psychologist. And so I did that. And talking to the psychologist helped a lot because I think there's really only so much a nutritionist can do. Like they can tell you about your caloric intake and like, you know, your metabolism. But that mental health piece is so important. And so I'm really glad that Heather pushed me towards the psychologist in college. And then what's your message to someone who's walking through that now? I mean, it's hard. I'm going to level with them. It's hard. It's brutal. Every single day is a massive struggle. And I think the biggest thing that people can do and the hardest thing that someone can do is, you know, find professional help. And I, I just hope that people don't see that as taboo. Because when I started talking to the psychologist, I was like, oh, there's something wrong with me. Like, this is so bad. But there's no shame in talking to a psychologist about your mental health, especially when it's something as important as life or death as an eating disorder. Like 
that eating disorder made everything in my life way harder. And that eating disorder is what led to my clinical depression, which led to these horrible thoughts of self-harm and all kinds of terrible things. And it all came from that eating disorder. And so, you know, talking to the psychologist, taking the antidepressants, like that saved my life. Mm. And so I think that it, it's hard to, to admit that it could be so life or death, but it, it can be. And a lot of times it is. And so I just really hope that anyone who's dealing with even just like the slightest thoughts or dealing with a minor case, like try to talk to somebody because it's, it's not worth it. It's never worth it. Mm. Do you like now in your everyday life, you said it's still a battle, like you still work on it. What do you do in the morning to like ground yourself and get ready for the day? So a lot of times I just eat what I'm craving and I eat what makes me happy. And I, I try not to get caught up in like the healthy stuff too much because that was, that was a big thing for me was I was so obsessed with being healthy that it was unhealthy. Mm-hmm. And so in the morning for breakfast, I eat cookies. Mm. I eat cookies and a cup of coffee. And then, you know, for snack, I will eat chips and unhealthy chips like Funyuns and Cheetos because it tastes good and I like it. Yeah. And I don't – I think that the the moment that I start thinking like, oh, well – I need to eat something healthier in the morning or I need to eat a healthier snack. Like that's when the bad thoughts kind of creep in and it it makes me feel like I'm not myself. That's so refreshing because really at the end of the day, if you're eating a little breakfast to go get a run in, you need, you need carbohydrates. Like you need, you need a little bit of, some people can't stomach food before they run and they eat like a goo or like a gel or something. And it's like, you need carbs to like get ready to go run. Yep. And cookies do the trick. And yeah. I eat like oatmeal cookies, yeah. but they're oatmeal chocolate chip and they're delicious. Yeah. And I love them. Yeah. Have you ever made the um, superhero muffins from Shalane's cookbook? I haven't, but I have friends that make them religiously. Those things are bomb. They're Those so are good. the best, like pre-run carb bomb. They're amazing. Yeah. I, the problem is like, I want my kids to eat them too, because they also do have like their nutrient dense and I end up just making 12 and then I'm the only one in the house that eats them. So I'm like, I need some of you children to get in on these muffins with me. (laughs) So funny. Yeah. They're so good. Um, what is something professionally or personally you would like to do that you haven't done yet? Hmm. I want to learn a foreign language. Do you have one in mind? Yes. I am currently trying to learn French. Love it. Okay. Have you been to Europe much? I've never been to Europe. Well, you're probably going to because there's going to be probably lots of racing opportunities in the coming years. Yep. And a lot of those people speak French. And so it'll be good to have that. That's awesome. Are you doing like a, like a Rosetta Stone or like a course? I downloaded that free app, Duolingo. Okay. And so I just, you know, do it for like 20 to 30 minutes every day. And when do you squeeze that in? Okay. Well, usually like (laughs) right after I'm done with work. Yeah. I'll be like on my computer anyways, and I'll have my phone with me anyways. I'll be like, okay, before I have a snack or before I eat dinner, like I'm just going to do this for 20 or 30 minutes. I love it. That's so good. I just interviewed someone else who wants to learn a foreign language and I can't remember who it was. Um, okay. Anyway, what, who is someone fun, motivating or inspiring you would like to have coffee, tea or cocktail with? Mm -hmm. I think probably Alicia Monson. Oh yeah. I have never interviewed her. She's really cool. I got to spend some time with her in Tokyo and she's really cool. And I, I think that if we, hung out, we would be really good friends. <laughs> um, I love that answer. That's so cool. Um, does she live? She doesn't live near you though. No, I think she lives in Longmont. So yeah, it's, it's like a 30 minute drive. Uh, well, you could, you could do a run together maybe once a, once a month or something. 
Oh, that'd be so fun. Um, you should reach out. I should. Do it. Uh, what is the best, most recent book you've read? Ooh, I read, well, the book I just finished was The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. Okay. And it's pretty interesting, but I think I really want some other, like, books about food that are written by maybe, like, people of color or people from like inner cities because Michael Pollan's perspectives were very like white uh-huh. wealthy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. But what the omnivores perspective. So like what's, what's his like gist of that? Like what is it's his basically, point? It's basically about like um, fast food and about how like humans, we eat this fast food, but it's like, it's really bad for the environment. It's really bad for us. It's bad for all these things. And that there are slow food options. And yeah, they're more difficult and they're less varied, but they do exist. And that's why I think reading a book maybe from someone from an inner city would be interesting because I know that that there are urban farms and I want to know how these communities are making slow foods happen in cities. That's really interesting. I kind of want to read that book now. Yeah, I mean, I have all the all the privilege in the world. Like, I have all the help I could possibly need with my husband here and, you know, whatever, the resources that I could ever need. But, like, it's so much easier yeah. to throw yep. my kid a granola bar. Or, like, mm-hmm. if things are crazy, we're going to stop at McDonald's, which I think is fine to do every once in a while. But, like, when you do actually – cook slow meals every day like there's a lot of people that just flat out don't have the time for that yep yep Uh, I mean I can't I can't imagine being a single mom and and trying to do that so uh, that's really interesting okay well if you can if you find a book from someone else like on this topic let me know what it is of course um what is your last message to leave with our audience today I think I just like to tell the audience that, you know, dreams change and grow as you change and grow. So, you know, don't ever lock yourself into one dream. Let yourself like grow and develop and pick dreams that kind of suit the direction you're headed. I love that. That's such good advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, Val, for coming on the show. Friends, don't forget to check out Koala Clip, koalaclip.com. Use the code ANOTHER for 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sandy Boy Productions Podcast Network. Check us out, sandyboyproductions.com. Leave us a rating and review and be entered to win a pair of Gooder sunglasses. All right, friends. Have a really great rest of your day, a wonderful Friday, and we've got some really good episodes banked up. I cannot wait to get them all out. I wish I could just publish them all right now. Uh, But next week, we've got an interview coming up with Parker Stinson, and he gets pretty vulnerable and shares a lot about his story that I think that you all will appreciate and enjoy. And also, he's running the Gate River Run this week, so lots of exciting performances to go down this weekend. Uh, All right, friends, have a great rest of your Friday, a wonderful weekend. And as always, I will see you next Friday.